All right, uh, our first guest is uh, Linda, Han Linda Hanneborg. Um, she founded and operates companies such as Hanneborg Holdings and Linda, Linda Hanneborg and Associates. Uh, she has over 30 years of experience as a marketing consultant, media strategist, and author spe specializing in brand building, brand management, franchising, board management services, reputation management, integrated marketing, crisis management, and crisis communications. Uh, she's been featured on the Today Show, Entrepreneur Magazine, US, USA Today, and many other shows and publications. Uh, please help me in welcoming Linda Hanford. I'm going to be introducing Pat Kinnickis, so I'm sure most of you guys already met her. Um, she founded Management Alternatives in 1983. She served as the chairman and CEO for 20 years. She led the firm from startup to an industry-recognized national leader in a corporate relocation logistics planning and management. Uh, she's also the founding principal of the Henley Group, which is a consulting firm focusing on emerging and high-growth companies. Uh, she has taught practical applications of entrepreneurship at the graduate level at the School of Management at Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Um, she served as the visiting entrepreneur in residence for the past two years, and she now serves as the Toma Family uh, Distinguishing Clinical Professor in Entrepreneurship. Please join me in welcoming. I'll be introducing Elaine Zanotti. Elaine is a uh, Stillwater native. Uh, she graduated from OSU in 1992 uh, with a BS in Family Relations and Child Development. Um, she first went to work in Chicago where she was the director <coughs> of uh, Christopher House, which is um, an early childhood program. Uh, it's actually the oldest social service organization in Chicago. Uh, <coughs> Later, she went to work in Washington, D.C., uh, where she worked as a consultant for AOL uh, and helped them develop um, corporate uh, child care centers uh, for employees at the, uh, the main headquarters. Uh, after that, she worked for the National Association uh, for the Education of Young Children, uh, also in D.C. Uh, she supervised the department that accredited early childhood programs uh, around the United States as well as overseas at uh, U.S. military bases. In 2002, Elaine moved back to Stillwater and she began working for the Oklahoma State uh, University Foundations. Um, when she got here, she, she realized two things uh, had changed over the, the 10 years she'd been gone. Um, one is that um, she was uh, just a little too old to hang out at the Strip. Uh, There's there a lot of uh, younger people there, and, and she didn't fit in. Um, the other was that there was no real place for adults to hang out um, and, uh, and you know, enjoy and have some beverages. Um, to meet these needs in the summer of 2008, uh, Lane and her husband, Gary Zanotti, opened Zanotti's Wine Bar. Uh, it's been running for three years and, and doing well. And in, uh, in 2009, Elaine took a position with Meridian Technology, uh, where she, uh, she currently works full-time and uh, runs the wine bar. Will you please help me welcome Elaine tonight. Well, welcome. So I'm going to start with a um, start with something I just um, got in uh, an email today. A friend sent me a um, a message, um, a forwarded message that said, um, "I'm going to talk about gay marriage today, but I'm going to call it by its other name. I'm going to call it marriage." He said because I had lunch today and it wasn't a gay lunch, and I just parked my car and it wasn't gay parking. So how important is it that we keep the word women or woman before entrepreneur for you. Is it, um, has the time come and gone? I went through the, the things that I think are important, but what about you? Is it important to keep that woman or female in front of entrepreneurship for you and your businesses? Sure. 
Um, well, it's an excellent question, and one of the questions that came to us ahead of time was something very similar to that. Um, what, how do you define yourself more as a woman entrepreneur or a woman who started a business? Um, well, in all cases, I think I haven't had any problems defining myself as a woman all along, but I do have to tell you, after being in the corporate world for uh, <coughs> almost 30 years and getting out of college and immediately going to work and um, joining a number of what I call women's associations, I am shocked to this day, 30 years later, that it is still necessary to have women's organizations. I would have thought they'd be long gone. So for me personally, I don't associate gender with what I do at all. However, I still believe there is a tremendous need for women to help other women and for us to understand that it is important for us to create an old girls network or a girls network as strong as what has been defined as the old boys network forever. So um, I'm an entrepreneur and that opens many doors for me and I'm finding that I'm an entrepreneur in a lot of different businesses. So whether or not I'm a woman is, is not of importance to me. What about your past? Well, I would have to say that um, when I started my company, there were not, there were weren't many women entrepreneurs. So the people I networked with were men. So I actually never would say I'm a entrepreneur. <coughs> I was an entrepreneur and I was with men and women and men and women do business. And so I would say that um, I think it's important to study the differences because there are definitely differences between men and women in business and whether they're entrepreneurs or not, there are differences. I always actually found that being a woman in business was an advantage because I was a federal contractor and I was also, I worked for many major corporations who had requirements to promote women business owners and minority and small businesses and therefore for me it was really quite beneficial. So, um, and I, and I, my first business was a paper route when I was eight years old. I was the only girl in the state of Connecticut who had a paper route. So I, that was different, and I found that it was a great advantage. I got bigger tips than my brother did. Everybody thought I was cute, and so it was never really a problem. So I'm pretty okay with you know, being a girl. I'm going to make it unanimous. I, I think when you are thinking about starting a business and, and, and getting um, your whole self into it, you think of yourself as an entrepreneur, just somebody who wants to start your business and make it successful. So I never once thought, I'm a woman, I'm going to have these obstacles. I think with each um, step that you take when starting a business and running a business, you have certain instances where yes, the gender does come into play. Um, and that's just the reality of the way things are. But I think if you are passionate about the business you're starting, you're just gonna hit it head on and just and go for it. Um, I agree with Linda that I think there should be more women networks or organizations for mentoring and supporting because I think there are a lot of women out there who maybe are more intimidated than they need to be. There is so much more opportunity in the current day for women um, who are wanting to start their business, be in a business than there has ever been. So I think the more the word can get out about what those opportunities are and the networks to get checked into so that if you're thinking about starting your business, you know where to go. I think that's important, but um, but no, it's not been a thought for me either. So when you, but, so when, but I think all three of you just said that, but there are some things. There are some things about gender that still 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, 150 years, are still there. So in terms of starting a business, so you know we hear about the glass ceiling, and um, and that's if you're working for someone, you know. And um, well, having worked with someone for someone before, before I asked about your business, did you feel that more working for someone is that what led you to start your own businesses? Was your opportunity around getting away from that? Is this true confessions? <laughs> Um, I had a father who was very entrepreneurial and had a lot of businesses and I remember when I was a little girl hearing him walk the floor at night trying to figure out how he was going to make his payroll 
And I thought, I am never going to have my own business because I'll just work really, really hard for someone else and I'll be a success that way. And, and I did, and I was, and however, it took me a whole lot of years to really realize the only way that you truly have control over your life, whether it's your business or your personal life or anything else, is to be in business for yourself. And so, um, you know, the biggest message you're going to hear from me tonight is, in my case, it was never too late, and in your case, it's never too early. So, um, any dream that you have, uh, you know, really go after it. And the beautiful thing about America today, too, is that there are so many businesses out there that you can already become a part of. and in that respect, have your own business too. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to be done through direct marketing and any number of things. So, but ever since I have left the corporate world, I am having the time of my life because all of those years in the corporate world have led me to what I do today. And I'm very, very grateful for all my corporate experience because I do have a lot of experience in a lot of different fields. So now I'm a consultant in what all you heard, and um, it's really uh, so enriching to be able to give back and help other people along the way. If I could just ask before I move on, so did, was, it a, was it a happy move, or did you move on to better things when you left the corporate world? I would say yes to, to both answers. It, it was timing, really. You know, the stars were in alignment, everything. Um, 20 years is a really long time, especially for a marketing executive. I was a senior vice president of marketing and communications for Express Employment Professionals in Oklahoma City. When I went with Express, they were uh, about 20 million in sales, and when I left, they were 2 billion in sales. So. I had a tremendous growth experience and opportunity to help the company move to that $2 billion level, and I learned a whole lot along the way. But to everything, there is a season. I just wasn't always sure exactly when that season for me would change, but it, the timing was, was perfect at that point. So Pat, your move to entrepreneurship, was it in response to a, an environment that wasn't giving you what you wanted? Yes, and actually it was the second time that the environment wasn't giving me what I wanted. The first time was I met my husband when I worked with him, and it was at a time when husbands and wives couldn't work in the same organization. It was the computer industry, so that today sounds really quite strange. So one of us had to leave. He was the president of the association, so clearly he wasn't leaving. So I left and got another job, and working as the uh, executive director of a law firm. And it got to the point where I had gone through five managing partners because nobody really wanted to do that job. And I said, well, I'll be the managing partner of the firm because I've done everything except to sign the cases. And it'll be fine because I was getting bored. And the senior partners thought it was a pretty good idea. The junior partners really couldn't get their arms around the fact that a woman was actually going to be the managing partner because I think there was only one woman who was a partner in the firm. And it was at a time, it was sort of cutting edge that a non-lawyer would actually participate in equity. And they said, well, no, we really can't let you do that. And I said, okay, well, here's the deal. Then I'm leaving, I'm gonna start my own business. They said, no, 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 we'll help you, we'll make you rich, we'll let you participate in all of the you know, investments. I said, no, that's actually not what I'm looking for. And so I started Management Alternatives as a result of that. And do you think that was because you were female? that I didn't get the, oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they said so. That and I wasn't a lawyer. And I'm not sure which was more important. It's very hard, it's a toss up. Mm -hmm. And while I really wanted to run a big law firm, there were like four or five really big law firms, they were all being run by men who were all friend, friends of mine and they weren't going anywhere. So I said, okay, fine, I'll just create my own wealth. Mm -hmm. So now here you are in Stillwater. No? Yes. Yeah, I have an unusual situation, yes. Okay. Yeah. I, my, my love and passion has always been early childhood and um, corporate child care and all that. And I had spent 15 years in, the, in that area and had kind of run the gamut of being teacher, director, consultants, working for um, a national association. And so when OSU approached me to come back and fundraise for them, it, it was a great opportunity because I had kind of realized I had run my 
gamut with that realm. And so when I came back here to fundraise for the college I graduated from, which happened to have a school of hotel and restaurant administration in it, um, and moving back to my hometown at, in my 40s, realized there is no place to go. <laughs> so I kind of fell into both my husband at the time, Gary and I decided we need to create something here in Stillwater that's for our age group because A, we don't have children, we're not going to have children. B, there's no place to hang out um, that's our age. We're too old for the strip. We don't want the strip anymore. And so we just kind of <laughs> fell into that. But I think kind of like you guys said, timing, timing plays a huge part sometimes in, in entrepreneurship. Um, it was good timing for us as far as financially, um, kind of what was available. We, there wasn't something that was competing with our idea. Um, and we took a couple years to get that going. So um, it, for me, it was a, yeah. But I would have never thought in a million years. Really? Good idea. Uh, so, what did, so what did it take? So did you start your businesses with your husband? You started this business. You started your business on your own. You started your business on your own. So what did it take? So now you've got to start the business. You've got to do all of this thing we keep talking about. Money, facilities, hiring people. So how did you how did you um, go about that? Especially if this was, um, well, you had um, an entrepreneurial father. I don't know if, uh, if you two had an entrepreneurial parent. You did also. So, had they taught you to do this? Were you ready to do it? To start this business? Get Was out I ready to do it? Yeah, take the risk? Well, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, when I made the decision, it was basically because I was bored. Yeah. And I really thought that this would be a great opportunity. And I actually did a business plan before I started the company. The challenge, at the, the first challenge was financing. Because at the time, uh, there were not a lot of banks who were willing to lend money to women. And I remember going into the bank with a very significant check to open an account. And this young fellow was with the senior vice president. And my husband had given us the introduction because the law firm that I worked with was a banking law firm. And I really didn't want to do business with any of our former clients. So my husband introduced me to the banker that his association used. And this charming young man came in with the senior vice president. And I handed him the check, which was for a significant amount of money, and he turned to my husband and said, what account, what name would you like the account in? Mm -hmm. And he said, you need to talk to her, she's the president of the company. And he said, right. So who was going to, are you going to sign the checks? Talking to my husband, and he said, I really think you need to talk to her, she's the president of the company. And so then I asked to speak to the senior vice president, and we walked to the side and I said, either you get him out of the room, or we're going out of the room. And you really can't allow this to happen because this is my money, it's my company, and I expect to be treated as an entrepreneur and as a business person. And he apologized profusely and said it would never happen again. And I said, you need to make it a learning moment for this young man because that's really not very nice. And it was very difficult because it's like, wow, this is really not the way it's supposed to be. Um, we did business with that bank until it um, collapsed. And then I went to another bank that had a different approach. Oh, good. But that was 10 years later, and by that time, you know, there were more women in business, so. How about when you, how about when you two started? How did you, you get this thing going? Was it a big risk? What did you learn? Well, let me start by saying how I advise others now. <laughs> and then I'll tell you what happened to me. Um, always have a plan. Have a plan A and have a plan B. And this is why I say if you are of an entrepreneurial mind, you can be doing more than one thing at a time, and you may get involved in more than one business, even now while you're going to school. There are things you can do on a part-time basis that can perhaps lead to what you really want to do in the future. But the important thing is to have a plan, have a vision, know where you want to go, and it may take you in several different directions. Um, I did not have a plan. I spent the last two years in the corporate world trying to decide when I was going to leave. You see, I'd already made up my mind I was going on to something else, but I was totally concentrating on that shining moment that I would uh, so-called retire uh, and go on to my next business, but I really didn't have a plan. Um, fortunately, what came to me were clients. People started coming to me within two weeks after I left Express and said things like, will you help me grow my business? I have a couple of really young entrepreneurs that had known me a long time 
and they came to me and this is how I started my consulting business and one led to another and because I was with Express Employment Professionals um, for many years even though I was uh, at the Franchisors <coughs> headquarters people thought I was a, a so-called employment expert and that I can help them find jobs or that I could help find jo uh, people for jobs at, at companies so what also turned into immediately for me was a lot of career consulting, helping people change their path in life and uh, showing them how that maybe their dream is something totally different than what they study. And I think Kenneth is, is a good example of going to different directions and now in the School of Entrepreneurship. So um, I now work a lot with individuals helping them to uh, create their dream. So I'm one of those, don't do as I did, <laughs> do as I say. So. so in terms of that break though, so financing, facilities. But when you're in the consulting business, you can start out really inexpensively and today, you know, everything can be done online and, and uh, virtual. And fortunately, I had an office already in my home because I was doing some other things uh, while I was still in the corporate world. So. I still office out of my home, but I have two clients that also have an office for me at their location. So it, it's just amazing how resourceful you can be without spending a lot of money building a business. Wow. But Elaine, yours is different. We need a building. You need a building. <laughs> <laughs> and you need money. Yeah, and exactly. Exactly. So, how, so yeah. tell us about that. Um, Gary and I realized when Gary and I dated um, back in the late '80s, early '90s. Uh, he owned delis in Oklahoma City, so he had done the business thing before and, and definitely had been in the hospitality restaurant. We both realized we didn't want to do the restaurant. That was 24-7, and so as the idea kind of evolved, we thought wine bar. It became very clear immediately. I think we both just had a vision about, I was very passionate about locating it downtown Stillwater. I'm very passionate about the downtown of any small town, city. I think it's kind of the heartbeat of um, any metropolis, no matter if it's a college town or not. So I was pretty um, uh, set on that. Uh, Gary and I both did not want to quit our full-time jobs and careers to start this business. I'm not sure I'd recommend that because we're three and a half years later and um, both still working full-time jobs. Um, we're now divorced, and but still running a very successful business. Um, we could do a whole class on, on that. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's very, very amicable. It's, it's great. In fact, he'd he be here tonight and be good. Um, but I think for us, uh, the finance and all that, we were very fortunate. We, were, we both were very smart with our money. Um, and moving back to my hometown, I already had some connections. So the banking industry and that type of thing was a little bit easier for me. But it's, it's amazing, even though I had grown up with these bankers, uh, if Gary and I went to the bank together, they would look at Gary first. And that's just the, that's the way it is. So in terms of perception and how this thing runs, so since we're talking gender the, and the impact of gender on this, so. I can remember coming up in the 60s, 70s, well, I'm 60s, 60s, 70s. <laughs> but my point, my point is, and I watched, we watched a real transformation of women in business, women business owners, we watched this transformation, and we sort of went through these, um, these, these reinventions of themselves, you know, from being the, the women we saw in the images when you walked in, to sort of those, those um, women in, in men cut, male cut suits and stern and, 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 and were bitchy. <laughs> so, to become, to become an office, what was your idea of what a business owner looked like and how did you portray that? And you talked about it, you had to look a certain way for bankers to take you seriously, a certain way for your suppliers, for your customers. So, in terms of gender, how did you, did you re recreate yourself? Did you um, make yourself into this thing that you thought a business owner should look like? I, I didn't. I, you know, I, it's funny. I, I think of, I think to the business I'm in now and where I was. I mean, I was in a very. I'm still in a very traditional field. Early childhood education is predominantly female. Um, there's a certain way people think about when they think of early childhood um, teachers. I, I never I'm proud to say I never wore a denim jumper. Um, but <laughs> I, I certainly had. Um, as far as uh, um, it, did I change myself for the for the wine bar? No, I think. Um, I made sure I was there when I said I was going to be there for my suppliers. Um, I got to places early. I made sure they knew my face and my name. I think I did more about my behavior than I actually did my look. I don't think I changed my look. So behavior? Too much behavior. 
I, I, owner's I, behavior? Did, what, what, what I think as far as just showing that I was competent, that, and it didn't matter whether or not I was male or female, it was just that I knew exactly what I wanted the wine bar to be and do, and so I wanted the others, when they, my suppliers, my staff, um, my patrons, I wanted them to know that I was there um, and dependable. So, I so I'll, go, I'll belabor yes, this a little yes. bit. So were you assertive? Were you, were you demanding? Were you, I mean, I mean these are all the things, yeah, you know, yeah. when, you, when you picture men owning businesses, you yeah. know, when you look at Steve Jobs, for example, you know, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, no one will say he's a nice guy. You know, we're sorry, but, but everyone says, no, he's a real bastard. No, I think I was passionate. I think people realized, um, and I had, once again, the advantage of being a hometown girl. So I think people um, perceived me, and I think still do, as someone who just wanted to improve the business atmosphere of, of Stillwater, Oklahoma. And so they understood my passion. They understood I was there until the end. And um, I think the fact that both Gary and I still work a full-time job, people are just kind of in awe of that, that we run a business and yeah. still work a new job. So how about you, Pat? I mean, I'm imagining a suit, stilettos, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> You've been looking at my closet? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you have to also realize that my business was in Washington, D.C., which is a pretty suit-intensive town. And the interesting thing is, once I started my own business, I, had, I was allowed to be less business suit stern than when I worked for the law firm, for example. But I think that um, I was always professional, and it was very, very important to always be professional. And I actually learned this from a client, and I think some of you may have heard this story. When we were working at the Pittsburgh International Airport, we, one of my, uh, actually she was the vice president, had, you know, normal hair, and one day she didn't blow dry it, and it was really curly. And it was a little wild, big hair. And uh, the client came into the office, and looked at her and looked at me and said, can I see you for a minute? And I thought, okay, this is not gonna be good. And we walked outside and he said, you know, if she looked like that in the interview, you would never have gotten the job. And this was for moving the Pittsburgh International Airport. And I have to tell you, I took my breath away because while I sort of intuited that it was important how he looked, I actually never realized it could have been that important. And I, from that point on, shared that story with staff every, every or a new staff orientation so that they would understand that how you look really does have an impact. I think the other thing is, in addition to how you look, you really have to be ready and on your game. And in our business, it wasn't good not to be assertive. So um, it was pretty clear who was in charge and that was what we were getting paid for. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't mean that we were necessarily bitchy or whatever, it just meant that if we had a job to do, we did it, we worked with people, we figured out how they made decisions, how they worked as a team, and we took it from there. However, if there was a problem, it was our job to solve it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not so sure, I think appearance does play a role, clearly it did in, in a lot of cases that I might not even have realized, but being prepared and being Letting people know that you're competent because you are prepared is very important. Absolutely. How about you? Coming from a corporate world, I imagine you brought a lot of that with you. Um, I worked for large companies, small companies, all, all sorts. <coughs> I was fortunate to go with Xerox Corporation when I went uh, when I got out of college, and certainly we dressed professionally. And I did training in public relations for them. I wanted to go into sales with Xerox now, a huge national company when I first approached them, and this was in the 70s, um, after they hired me as what was called a customer representative, and that was really a prestigious job. If you can imagine training people on, a, on Xerox equipment um, today, it's, but there was a lot more to it then than just pushing a button. Um, but when I asked about going into sales, the response I got was, I'm sure we have a woman in sales somewhere in the United States. And soon after that, they did start putting a, a number of women in sales. But again, there was a, a definite gender um, question at, at the time. But regardless, um, I've always dressed professional. I do have to say that at Express headquarters, we had a dress code, which was uh, very foreign to me when I went there and still when I left, but it was for the women, suits with skirts, no slacks, uh, heels, and pantyhose every single day. 
So I do have to tell you, since I have left Express, <laughs> I think I've had a skirt on maybe four or five <laughs> times. <laughs> yes. And uh, pantyhose twice. Um, so I, I've i always had a flair for fashion, and, and it was really hard for me to toe the line to a, what I really call the, not a dress code, but a uniform. Um, so there are ways that you can be professional without having to actually dictate it. But I will tell you, being in the employment industry, you need to, when you are interviewing, whether it's with a banker or for a job or anything else, interview dressed like what you want to accomplish. So dress not for the job <coughs> you're interviewing for, but the job you want, where you want to go because clothes really can make a difference. So how, so how do you build, how did you build a business that sort of captured where you want women to be? How did you create a job that reflected where you thought women entrepreneurs should be, people working, women working under you? And when you start, because the next question will be about, and how do you set up a network of peers that, that look like you, that, that, that embolden you and strengthen you? But, so how did you set up a business that reflected all the things we're talking about? Quality. Well, um, and I have to go back to it. when I went with Express, again, it was not the company that it is today, but I was very excited because I was told we're going to build this national company, maybe even go into an international company, and Linda, we want you to head up marketing and corporate communications for the company. And I said, oh, great. Well, I had just come from television. I worked for a television station, and before that, I was a publisher of a magazine, and before that I worked for Xerox. So I had a pretty well-rounded uh, background in marketing, communications, advertising, and public relations. So my first thought was, oh, well, you're a national company. We'll spend money on national advertising. You have like 10 offices across the country. You're national, and we can create a big campaign and all of this, and I'm just getting very excited. And Bob Funk turned to me and said, well, there are a couple things you need no. Number one, we don't have any money. And number two, I don't believe in national advertising. So find a way, and I'm sure he didn't use the words to build this brand 20 years ago, but he said find a way to help us really put this company on the map without spending any money. And um, so I proceeded to uh, go back to my office and put my head down and think, what the heck can I do? And what we started doing was a huge public relations campaign putting out press releases. We made the news any way we could. Uh, now, when you send out press releases, the media will determine what's newsworthy. But if you're not sending out things, believe me, you're not going to get any publicity. But I think my real niche was I learned how to get recognition and win awards for the company, for my department, for my discipline, and to really build an image for the company without spending a lot of money. So having left Express, where I've now really um, focused a lot on is helping other, and in this case, women, to get the recognition that they deserve in their fields. And I was thinking, driving up here, probably in the last three years, I have nominated close to 100 women at all ages for various and sundry awards and recognitions that are out there in various disciplines. And one of the best ways to build your uh, profile is to have someone else come to you and say, what can I do to help you? How can I get recognition for you? Because there are all kinds of awards and, and recognitions out there. And you know, if I pull this into entrepreneurship, I have to give a plug for OSU all over again. But your um, We Inspire conference, I don't know of any other conference across America that is actually centered on women entrepreneurs. It is very specific. It's for women in business or women who want to start a business. And that's to be commended, it really is, um, because there are lots of other endeavors out there and all kinds of conferences for, for women, leadership, any number of things. But Let's build on that then. So did you build, or did you build a women's a, a business that actually reflected your femaleness? Was there anything in there as a, as a woman entrepreneur that um, had that 
major as a woman's is the business, anything in there that the way you ran it, the way you set up your vision, was there something in there about, about being a woman that made it different, special? Uh, well, no, I don't think it was, I don't think it had something to do with just being a woman because in, the, in 1983 when I started the business, there were not that many women in business, so it would be very difficult to, if, if you're going to succeed, you have to do business with your customers in your market, and the market was filled with men. So I would have to say that in 1983, men helped me more than women did because that's who was there. And although there were one or two women entrepreneurs who became very good friends, and we did try to help each other, but we were a minority of a half a dozen in a city, um, you know, of several hundred thousand people. So I think what my vision always was is that men and women needed to work together because that's what the marketplace was. But it was going to be clear that women in my company also had positions of authority. So I had women who were vice presidents. I had men who were vice presidents. I had women on my board, I had men on my board. And it was very important for, I had uh, people of color on my board and I had all ethnic diversities in terms of the, the office itself so that when it was time to field a team, we could reflect what our clients were. And that was actually more important than just being a, a woman entrepreneur. Now I will say today, and then of course I got involved with the Girl Scouts and that actually does focus on girls and women. And interestingly enough, that became one of the larger networks because these women who were executive women all were Girl Scouts growing up. I wasn't, but this whole group of women that I now play with um, are all executives. Some have their own businesses, some don't. So it is, there are more networks out there and there are opportunities that just didn't exist in 1983. But I don't think I did anything in particular to make it a woman-owned business. I just took advantage of it. So, then I'll ask Elaine, so is the idea of the woman-owned business really only about ownership? Is there no female sensibility? Is there something else that you bring to it? Is it only about... How different it is from you two? I, I think, I, I look back three years ago to downtown Stillwater and Gary's other job was working in the airline industry and so he traveled, still does, 75 to 80% of the time. So I became the face and the person behind Zanotti's wine bar. And it's been interesting because three other businesses who have had a woman's influence have come downtown. And I think part of it was because of the fact that Zanotti's Wine Bar and myself promoted that. Um, Louis, even though it's run by um, a group of um, men, it's a chain, the woman who owns the building Louis is in is very much a managing partner in that, Lisa Kistler. And she came to me and said, okay, how did you make this work? So that I could be, you know, so she came to me. Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory came down um, downtown. Jenna Boyer, another woman, said, okay, let's make this happen. Flourishes, um, Flora Shop, owned by two women. Um, we're seeing more women businesses coming in downtown. I think they saw what Zanotti's could be and passionate about growing downtown. There's another restaurant that's opening up, Brooklyn's. Um, it's going to be a restaurant, a wine cellar. It's, it's a group of men, but they came to us and asked us what worked well in downtown, what didn't work well in downtown. They've done all their planning at Sonati's Wine Bar, so I think there's something to be said. I don't think I set out to make my business more female. I think it's just I happen to be the face of Zanotti's, and so people want to know what's what I've done to make it successful. Well, you actually are talking, talk, you actually hit on some of the um, characteristics of women-owned businesses, because one of them is the focus on relational, mm -hmm. relational um, 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 activities, you know. And so the idea of building this network, it actually builds on the idea of. Um, of some of the characteristics that you that you might bring. So, but if the strength, if your business, if your business is not showing, um, yeah, um, and that's for you, for you too. If this is not really about a female business. How do you build? Then what would a female network do? If it's a business network, there's lots of things, suppliers and customers and all, and banks, and there's a network. What would a what is the role of a female network if your businesses are not? Female. What do, you, what, what do you want that network to do? Is it really just for? Oh, the network has to. It's a network just like any business network, and they have and more women today. The networks today are a whole lot more fun than they were 30 years ago, because the women who are in the networks actually have positions of power, 
So, and that's what's important in your networks in terms of doing business. There is a social component that women have that's a little different than men, and that's okay. And we know, we understand it, and we like it, and we you know enjoy it. But uh, a lot of the networks that I participate in are because they enhance my ability to do business. So, but but those are those networks um, women only? Some are. So what happens to those women only uh, entrepreneurship? Um, I'm not telling you. <laughs> 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 no, you really want to know. Why do you want to know? <laughs> if it, um, in, 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 in the abstract, without telling the secret password, is it about, is it, is it support? I mean, I mean. Oh, it is support. I mean, there are a number, first of all, it's great to be in a situation where um, if you are the primary uh, breadwinner in the family and your husband stays at home and you know that there's someone else out there who has the same thing and the husbands are staying at home and taking care of the kids, it's nice to know that that, that exists so that you don't think that you're actually a freak of nature. And um, it's very interesting just to be able to share issues that, you know, there are work-life balance issues that typically are not ones that men have to deal with. And it's great to know uh, that there are other people in, in the world who have the same problems you have. And then invariably it turns to, and so who do you need connections with and how can we make some money? I mean, today women's networks that are entrepreneurship networks, I think, are about business. And there's that social component too. But thank God for the wine work. you go to the group? I would. Um, as a matter of fact, last night I attended an organization called NABO, National Association of Women Business Owners. It is a national organization. Uh, this obviously was a local uh, chapter in Oklahoma City. And the focus of that organization is women in business helping each other. And the format's pretty simple. We meet for uh, cocktails and then everyone goes around, introduces themselves, tells what their business is, and asks for help uh, in her business. And there's always a keynote speaker that brings uh, really educational value to the organization. But NAVO has also a sister organization that I have become very uh, active in. As a matter of fact, I'm on their national board. And it's called NWBOC, National Women Business Owners Corp. And they are the first organization to actually certify women business enterprises. And that's a whole other avenue that is available to women and minorities to become certified as true business owners. And some of the things that were on the screen tonight talking about what is a true woman business owner you have to have majority ownership in the business and if you are in business to business or you work with companies that do business with the government there are some real advantages to becoming certified and i got extremely active in it with express because we have a lot of women franchisees and franchisees own their own business they are in business for themselves just not by themselves and there was a lot of confusion on the Hill as to whether or not a woman franchisee should be or could be certifiable as a woman business enterprise. And after three years of my politicking, I'm, I'm so thrilled to say that they are now recognized as independent business enterprises as well, as are minority businesses and minority franchises. So people understand what, what actually goes on is um, with certification, you have to, you, you sort of swear to the government that your business is actually 51% owned by a woman. And once that happens, there, there are government programs that say, we have set aside um, incentives or projects or, or dollars, contract dollars, only for women-owned businesses, but you have to certify. And certification is more than just self-certification. You've got to go through this. It's so, actually women-owned and operated. Women owned and operated. That means so the husband just can't say, here, sign this, you're 51%, right. now go home and cook. You know? You've got to be part of this part of this thing. Have you taken advantage? So are you all able to take advantage of these, um, these incentive programs? These incentive, incentive well, I, programs? I take advantage of it because I consult with a lot of women business owners. So I'm educating them on this opportunity and all for their businesses. 
and still sitting on that national board, I really keep apprised of new laws and opportunities. And so it's, it's such an unknown out there as a great opportunity for women in business. Pat, I know you are as a government zone. Um... Yes. We definitely took advantage of that. In fact, I would say that um, I didn't realize what an advantage it was until I sold the company and then afterwards it wasn't owned by a woman anymore and the owner came to me and said, well, would you like to buy 51% or can I give you 51% of it back? And I said, no, thank you very much. But um, we did many millions of dollars in business because we were a woman-owned business. And as I often say, you get the first, you might get the first contract because you're a woman-owned business. You still have to deliver. But we were sought after uh, by many, many large federal contractors to be on their team because they had set aside requirements that they had to fulfill. And we also had corporate clients who were very thrilled with the fact that we were certified as women-owned business because it, it helped them immensely. Right. And, I mean, and these are requirements the government requires that after a certain amount, you have to do it. And right. if you don't do it, at, um, a part of whatever works out, you, you, have, you lose all of your um, benefits, you can't get contracts. But in your, in your field, are there incentives? And you know, incentives? we actually established an eyes wine bar under as an eyes investment LLC. So we actually established a business entity, and then an eyes wine bar falls underneath that. We haven't been able to take advantage probably as much as your business is based on the fact that we are in a hospitality and bar mm -hmm. um, area. However, because we did establish ourselves as an LLC, that does give us some avenues of funding um, that would be yeah. helpful for that. Yeah. Well, since you're all talking success, so we saw, we saw, um, um, we sort of wanted to we'll move to you guys in just a second. So how about growth? So you, you know, so federal contracts, success, consulting. So why, why the choice not to become gazelle? Why not fast growth, Zanatis, why aren't franchises? What, what holds you where you are, um, what keeps you where you are? I would probably say, I, I don't, I think it's out of the realm for us to do another Zanotti's wine bar somewhere. I think we are three and a half years into a business that both Gary and I are thrilled and uh, overwhelmed, I think, at the success. I mean, when we did our business plan and planned out five years and thought, okay, one year we're going to lose money, two years hopefully we'll, you know, you, you do out your business plan on that, and within four months of the first year we're breaking even, I think you think, wow, we're doing something right. Um, but businesses do two things. They get better or they get worse. You cannot keep them the same, mm -hmm. as always. So you always have to think about, okay, what are what are some things that we need to do? You know, we want to get the Stillwater one going pretty well. I would probably say in the next year or so, I think Zanotti's will, now it won't, it won't be in Stillwater, but I think we'll, we'll certainly expand it. Yeah, that's great. And Pat, yeah. Well, my business, I don't think, was really, is not a gazelle business, because it's a service, it was a service business, but it, it was a managed growth and we did become a national company and that was always a vision to be a national company and actually when I sold it to the, the company who bought it, it was with the expectation that they would grow it even bigger because it had the capacity to grow um, but unfortunately they weren't able to do that because they just couldn't figure out the synergies. Mm -hmm. but, um, and I don't think it was ever a gazelle, it was never in a gazelle market but it was, we grew pretty quickly. But that, that choice was not a gendered choice? No. Okay. And I think prior to it, is sometimes when you're doing something right, especially in the hospitality industry where I'm at, um, you've seen restaurants that you really love or places you love to go to and all of a sudden they expand or they suddenly change their momentum because they're growing and you lose the what it was that made them successful in the first place. And I think what I'm really proud of with Sonatis is we've not ever had to change our vision our goal, you tweak it because what always looks good on paper is what happens when you're really doing it in real life. But we haven't ever had to sway very far from our original vision, and so I wouldn't want to do anything to the business that would hurt that because that's what made it successful in the first place. You have to be creative in thinking about ways to expand that don't cause you to lose what it was you were starting out to do in the first place. Before we um, turn it over to uh, some questions, that's what answer that question. Uh, well, a gazelle moves really fast, yes. right? Uh, I feel that I have been moving really fast, but I think I feel more like a giraffe than a <laughs> gazelle because I've stretched a lot. And um, one thing I did that was really smart, and I didn't know it at the time, but naming my company Linda Hannah Borg Associates 
gives me a lot of flexibility to, first of all, really never have any employees if I don't want any. But I can now bring in all kinds of associates that have expertise in some of the areas that I have been dabbling in. And you know, the, my last year at Express, I my mentor became God. And I said, whoa, is this the right time? And what should I do? And all of that. You know, For once, I actually put my life to somebody else to take care of. And now I'm at the point where I'm saying, OK, God, let's slow down. Let's slow down, because I I have a speaker's bureau, I am writing a book, I have helped two other people write books, and we're at production now, or publication, so I'll be taking them on the road. I um, have all this marketing consulting I'm doing. I mean, I'm just kind of going in circles. So what animal goes in circles all the time? The rat in the cage, I guess? So I'm a rat and a giraffe at the same time. But along the way, I have reached out to many, many people that I have worked with over the years that have tremendous knowledge and expertise in areas where they can help me. And they now are one of Linda Hanover's associates. And really, I'm going to start focusing on the things I really enjoy. But the problem is I'm enjoying all of this, but I'm, I'm, I'm spread too thin. So. Let's forget about growth. So I think it's time now that we ask some questions um, of you. Let's all start here. Jasmine. Um, as women starting your own companies, how do you think customers perceive you in regards to you being the, the owners of the company? I'm just curious as to, has there ever been any issues with customers or clients that just because you're a woman? You know, when you work in a bar, <laughs> uh, not in the sense of um, it impeding anything that I've done. Uh, I think, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I think when we first started out going to the banks, they would look at Gary first. But as I kind of became the person that was there most of the time, no, I think kind of what we've all said. I think we both we all wanted to make our businesses successful, and so I think there's a certain passion, um, stability. You're always on your game. You always are, you know, trying to be prepared. I think the big thing too is I really worked on empowering my staff because I couldn't do it by myself. I surrounded myself with people that had strengths that I don't have because I think that's what makes a business work. Um, I'm fortunate that Gary and I have a very different set of skills. So our business thrives on the fact that we have very different sets of skills. I have a manager who has a different skill set than me. And that's good because he can see things about running the place that I can't. So I think when people see that you try and surround yourself with people that help make your business successful, I think that's and I would have to say that in the early days of my business, most of our business came by referral. So we were, I was always referred to a client by somebody, and nine times out of ten it was a man. So when I went in, whether that had something to do with it or not, there was never really an issue that we weren't confident. I'm not sure, because a lot of what I'm doing now is reputation management. A company will hire me usually for the spokesperson or the owner of the company to really put them into the position of where they have grown to be. So uh, on occasion, I have sat down with this person, and it usually is a woman, and I, uh, before signing any kind of a contract or anything, I will tell her what I'm going to be telling her, uh, some things that she's going to need to change as far as her dress and all sorts of things and there have been times that I did not get the contract and I don't know whether the fact that I was a woman or not made a difference um, but I feel if you're going to pay me to help you with your visibility and, and your image then you better be ready to listen to what I have to say and it's not all nice and so had I been a man doing the same thing I, I don't know I don't think I don't think it would hire a man in that case period relationships was something that was really important to women in businesses. Are there other traits that you think make, that women generally have, maybe more so than men, that help them be more successful as entrepreneurs? No offense, guys, but I think we're better able to multitask. We're used to it. So, I think we're used to just <laughs> 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 Please don't come <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think, and I, I said because looking over history, it's, you know, 
caring for the house, raising the kids, you know, juggling multiple things. Um, <coughs> I would say that one of the things I found very helpful first was having an older brother who um, <coughs> said, you know, you have to be able to talk to, every, to talk to guys, so you need to learn about sports. And so I did that. I think that one of the things women probably don't do is we probably don't get into fights uh, around a conference room where we start pointing fingers or you can feel the level, attention level. We fight in a different way, and trust me, we fight. But I, I think that that's probably, it's not so important who's right or who's wrong as long as you get the job done. And then afterwards, you figure out what you need to do. In fact, one of our competitors, who was a business owned by a man, that's what he used to do. If something was going wrong with the project, he would immediately engage in some sort of combat and, and, fig and point fingers at who did what. And, my style was, we need to get the job done, and then afterwards, we'll have a discussion about who's responsible and, and accountable. So I think that we pick our times differently <coughs> to engage in discourse. We being women. We, yes, we being women. Okay. Um, I would agree that we're nurturers, we're caretakers, and uh, that's just innate. Um, uh, so I, I think that's an advantage we have. But by the same token, maybe we're too empathetic at times where uh, men might tend to take a little stronger line in, in the business world. Uh, I don't know. But I think women still today have to walk a really fine line too because if you are aggressive, confident, assured of yourself, then um, you're, you could be looked upon differently than a man that has all those same qualities. So it's, it's we're still working on getting there. So interesting. So females, so there are female characteristics, you know, and you know, we, you know, yeah. we, we won't let that one go. Um, how about a guy? Yes. Turn uh, hat back as a, a guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, being the owner of a business, do you find it, uh, or do you find men working under you um, treating you different by any means or? I'm older than most of my staff, so I think they they treat me differently because I'm older. Um, I'm probably more of a mother figure for them, but not, not in the sense of because I'm a female. For, for my instance, I think it depends on the guy and whose mother was. Because <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. <laughs> if his mother worked and was a professional woman, he probably won't view a woman who's his boss the same way as someone who's never had any female uh, in a position of authority other than his mother. I mean, I would have to say that some of the men that worked for me had a problem working for me and some didn't have a problem working for me and I think it was just a function of who they were and some didn't like the fact that they worked for a woman. I don't know why they took the job because it was pretty clear I owned the company. But. <laughs> I think it depends on the level because um, I had lots of employees over the years and I probably had a, a few conflicts with management level who reported to me who really wanted to be where I was instead of reporting to me uh, but employees in general I didn't have any problems with. Hmm. Yes. Um, would you say that given um, equivalent positions men are perceived as more influential to women? And then also, um, do you think that men are also more likely to resist influence from women? China ties in. Can I repeat that again? Yeah. <laughs> um, would you say that given um, equivalent positions, the same type of yeah. positions, uh, men are perceived as more influential than women? Men are perceived as more influential? I think it depends on where they are. I think, yeah, it totally depends on what area they're in. Well, how about as, as business owners? Did, they, did you even out the, um, it's one thing. Oh, I think I as think a business it's owner, it's, you're equally as influential. You may not be with your banker, but I would say even today, 30 years later than when I started, mm -hmm. my company banks are much more receptive to women business owners than they were then. But I don't think there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, we know the glass ceiling is an invisible barrier to grow Females in business organization. Is there something like glassing to males in female-owned business? Hmm. 
So the question he asked was, you know, is there, just, just like there's a glass ceiling if you were working in a corporation, the question he asked, is there a sort of a glass ceiling in terms of female um, business owners? You know, is there, a, a certain, is there a certain number or a certain place? Is there some sort of a limitation to, for growth, where you can go? The demand would be in my business there wasn't, except that they weren't going to get my job unless they bought the company. <laughs> but other than that, I had men who were vice presidents and women who were vice presidents. So there was no glass ceiling in that respect, except for my job. Yeah, and there's a whole other uh, area here, too, that Dad has mentioned, and that's uh, boards, company boards. Um, there's still much, much more uh, advantage for men on on boards than women. So I was delighted to hear you had an equal number on your company. I think the other, the other question is, so was there room for more than one woman-owned logistics business in Washington? Is there room for more than one wine bar? Is there, you know, is there, you know, is there only one? No, there was no one. No, no, no. Nothing holds you, so. yeah. 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 Hold you back in terms of growth and no. where you can go? No. Was that, was, there, was, that, was that ever the case? What, that? In the 70s, 80s, 90s, as you came through, was there only one pack-owned business? Could you have, was there another business, one women-owned like yours? Or yes, there was another woman-owned business that came afterwards, so we had to compete a little bit harder. And we, you know, when the, the primary uh, competitor went out of business, I was really very sad because I figured out how to beat him, and now I had to learn to beat somebody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. You hear, uh, a lot of talk about how men get paid more for the same position than women. In the companies that you own, do you happen to pay men more, or is it equal across the board, or do you pay women more? No, I pay, I pay my employees for their performance. If men performed better than women in a similar position, they got paid more. If they didn't, they got paid less. Do, did you support, do you support women moving them up, even if they're unskilled, to move them up, to train them to become equal men? Some of the things we said, you know, about training and background. Oh, I trained all of my employees, and if somebody really, I, and in fact, when I retired, one of the women who I had promoted from being, she was a part-time data entry person, and when I left the company, she was the vice president, stood up and said, without me, she would never have had the opportunity, because I gave her training, I gave her opportunity, I paid for education, I gave her positions of authority as she earned them, and uh, so I do believe in doing that. But I did it for men, too. I, I really don't. You don't keep a special eye out for, for women, uh, a special push? Yes, I probably did. How about you, too? I don't. I, I, to me, it's the person who does the best job. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, like again, I'm in the service industry. Now, I'd be curious if I went back and looked at how my staff were tipped. That might be different. Oh. Yeah. How, about, how about you, Linda? No, nope, makes no difference. It's the person, and uh, the most important ingredient of all is attitude. People have to have the right attitude, and if there's a job or a business you're looking for, go after it. If there's a company you want to work for, even go and tell them that you'll do an internship there, and, and come back to OSU and say, I want to do an internship at such and such company. You know, create your path in life, it's possible. And like Pat, I had a young lady that came to me as an intern and ended up being director of marketing um, and just had an awesome career. But she created that path. But you do give a sister a break. And I, you know, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I also had a young man that came as a graphic artist and ended up running the whole um, creative arts Department and now he has a, his own business and is very successful with his wife. <laughs> so <it's laughs> How about more? How about down the back? Um, I have a question. With the typical business culture sort of being male dominated with more male employees, do you feel as a um, being a women owned business, do you have sort of the opposite demographic being more females than males? And what um, Advantages, disadvantages, just unique aspects are there to having a business owned by a woman with uh, to the employees. So I had equal numbers of men and women, depending on what the job was and who was the most talented. So I really didn't keep score in terms of how many 
Um, there were certain tasks that men were more suited for, and there were other tasks that women were more suited for, and positions, and so that's how I would hire. So who, who are your role, who are your business role, your entrepreneurial role models? So, you know, I mean, we see a lot, we see Oprah, we see Martha, you know. Who, who are your um, entrepreneurial role models? Well, mine have changed over the years, but um, originally one of my role models was Jane Pauley because I felt that she was really a, a, a true journalist and um, did an exceptional job on, on the Today Show. And um, one of the organizations that I belong to is called uh, Association for Women in Communications. Um, I actually met Jane and we um, received the same award from that national organization. So um, she was my role model in the communications arena. But today, my role model is a woman by the name of uh, Melanie Sablehouse, who has literally done it all. She was in the corporate world. She worked for IBM, was very successful, moved to New York with her husband on an assignment uh, and found that there was no real good temporary housing in New York. And she decided to start a company where that's exactly what they did. They provided housing. Um, decent housing for executives on short-term assignments. And it grew into a wonderful company, and then she moved to Washington, D.C., did the same thing there, turned around, sold her company, um, and that company went public. So not only was she a successful corporate executive, but found a need in society and created a business and was very successful. And today, she spends her time uh, speaking and giving back and helping other women to be lifted up. And she is absolutely one of the greatest speakers I've ever heard as well. So, I'm, she's, she's done it all. So. Actually, it was, it was a man that served on my board for 20 years who was a businessman. He was um, a marketing genius. He was just, um, he was always the person that I was able to call and First question I always asked was, what was my backlog? But then he would talk to me. But. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm sorry to say, I don't have a specific role model. I, I, you know, I, I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. Um, I think I'm a huge reader, so I'm always interested in how companies who have been very successful, what their philosophy is on, or what their CEO's philosophy was on growing their business. So the Starbucks and the Jack Welch's and all those, I kind of take a little bit from all of them <coughs> and then kind of see what my own viewpoints are. So I, I don't see. have a specific one. And you're in Jack Welch and that whole game. Yeah. And what about, what characteristics in terms of leading a business? I think empowering people, um, being clear about what your vision is, um, letting, uh, you know, a good friend of mine says, surround yourself with people that um, can embrace your vision and then allow them to do it. More questions? Yes. Along the lines of visionary Steve Jobs who just died, Oh, did he just die? Did he die? Yeah. So, um, that is my actual question. So, that's another question in itself. But um, along the lines of work life balance for women, it's a whole different world. Um, your life is your work, and your work is your life, your family is your life. So, um, from what you have experienced, how can you guide the future generations um, forward in this moving world? I guess I'll start that one since I have the most drama. Um, you know, I, I'm still learning. I don't balance very well. I think why we have successful businesses is because we give a lot to them. I think we have a hard time figuring out what that, that balance is. And then you topple that with my situation of not wanting to give up a regular paycheck um, every month, so not so still working another job. Relationships are important to me. Um, Gary and I's marriage did not did not make it because of our businesses. There were other things that happened, but I think we both were very um, career and business oriented. So I think that played into it also. And so I think it finds your balances. Uh, really take a break every once in a while because I think you have to always be able to take a step back. If you're in your business and doing your career every single day, you miss things. And one of the things you've got to always be on top of is what's going to keep your business successful. And if you don't allow yourself some breaks and some time to step back, it can 
be challenging. So I'm still learning. So if you find out, you let me know. I would say that um, women can have it all, but you just can't have it all at the same time. So my mom says. Oh. <laughs> well, listen to your mom then, because she's right. Um, you, you just, you know, if you're going to launch a business and you're going to make it successful, I really marvel at those women who can leave at 3 o'clock and go pick up their kids. Uh, that was just not something I could ever have done. And so I think you can have it all, you just can't have it all at the same time. So your business choice and your and your and the other roles you play, wives and and um, and mothers and, and friends. You, did you find yourself tailoring your business? Did you tailor your business around your life? Did you end up editing your life to fit your business? The business you, and could you and could, could you, you define life? <laughs> <laughs> well, couldn't you as a, as the owner? Couldn't you have made the business anything you wanted to make it? Yes. You, could, you can make it anything you wanted to make it, but if you had, a, and my vision was to make it a national company, so that was my vision, so I tailored my life around my business, and then when I sold my business, I had a great life, and then I flunked retirement, and here we are. <laughs> well, unfortunately, because my friends like to hang out where my business is. <laughs> yeah, that was very multitasking. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> Please. I'm curious, um, Ms. Anani, you said that there's a company opening a restaurant with a wine cellar and you're helping them? Is it that somewhat of a competitor? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think so. Um, Brooklyn's is going to be a full service restaurant um, and their wine cellar is not going to actually be a, um, a wine bar like Zanotti's. Um, Zanotti's is never going to be a full service restaurant and the way that I see it is it's another wonderful business coming in downtown. Still what our needs more adult places, um, more food places that aren't chains. Um, the gentlemen that are putting it together have planned um, what they're doing. They've asked us what's worked for us, what hasn't worked for us. I see it as a true partnership. I think I did the same thing when I was getting ready to open up a wine bar. I went to those that looked successful and said, what, what worked, what didn't work? And amazingly enough, people are pretty willing to share what their successes are. Um, I hope it's a true partnership. I want someone to come have a glass of wine as nice before they go to Brooklyn's, and I want them to come think about having a glass of wine with us after they go to Brooklyn's. So it makes sense to me to tell them what's worked well and what hasn't. I'm going to ask the guys, so just to, the guys stay here for a minute, I'm going to ask um, our, our, our women to speak to the women in the audience. And not just about just advice. If you had to advise, if you had to guide them, mentor them to look for opportunities for new businesses today, knowing what you know and where things are, perhaps the things you decided on. What would you tell the young women entrepreneurs in the audience? Where do you, where do you look for the where would you look for your new opportunities? Where would you guide them? What would they see? Where do you see growth? Where do you see opportunities? Be exploited? Well, the first thing I'd suggest is you find out what your strengths are. And I don't know if you all have been um, studying any of the uh, strength finders. Are you all familiar with that? Marcus Buckingham and the Gallup organization and, and what they've done. There's a book called Now Discover Your Strengths. You can uh, read the book go in online and, and literally find out what your strengths are. So you need to learn more about yourself as quickly as possible as you can. And those strengths are going to change over the years, too. But once you know what your strengths are and you can articulate them, it's going to help you to really determine what you're going to be good at, what you'll be happy doing. And that's really important. You know, there are a lot of things you can do, lots of businesses you can get into to make a whole lot of money. But just making money doesn't always um, create satisfaction. So. Um, that is my first piece of advice, and secondly, to go to people that you do admire, um, who are in a field that um, you want to get into, and ask them how they got there, and ask them for help and advice. And all of us in life, I believe, need three different levels of contacts. We need mentors. We need peers, we need uh, people who are equal to us that we can bounce ideas off of. And even at your age, you also need to turn around and look as to whom you can become a mentor and bring along and help um, to decide what they're going to do in life. And um, all of that together can be a tremendous benefit to you to help you along the way. 
So, so female bonding, female mentoring. Not world. just females. Uh, we're talking people. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, how about you talk to, to the young women? Well, I think that uh, what I would counsel you is to figure out or to try to figure out what you really want in life. Because if you do want to have a family, then you need to figure out where that will fit in to your life. And if you don't, that's okay too. I don't think there is any prescribed thing that you need to do. And if you happen to love something and you want to do some traveling and figure out if there's really a market, leave this area, go throughout the country and find out if there are opportunities and experiment and take risks now when you're young and you don't have all, you don't have a mortgage and all of those kinds of things. To tell you where to find opportunities, I think that, you know, I would not counsel you to keep your, you know, to, to keep your networks all female. I mean, I really do think that men and women need to be together and it makes a much richer and robust uh, environment. So look to both men and women to be your mentors and your colleagues and to find other opportunity. I really don't think it's a good thing. Uh, although I will say that I went to an all women's college, there are many of them left, and it was really very empowering in many ways because it was an opportunity as a woman to get your voice. And I think that is probably the one thing I would counsel you to do, is to figure out how to find your voice and then use it, practice it, practice using it and get better at using it because I think that we tend not to find those opportunities because a lot of the social issues that come into um, being just are make it a little more difficult. So find, find your voice and then use it. One thing I might add too, you know, there are many growth industries that are just burgeoning right now. So um, health care, any kind of services, um, certainly the food industry continues to grow and you think of things that we need necessity of life. Uh, even who would have thought 20 years ago that we'd be buying water all the time, you know? We, so it's hard to even find a water fountain anymore and most of the time we pass it up because we'd rather drink our bottled water. So. It's also the idea of finding something that's already out there a necessity, but doing it better than someone else. And Starbucks, of course, is a great example of what they've done with coffee, and everyone else has tried to emulate them. Well, I don't know if I have that much more to add from what you two said. I think that probably the big thing, too, is, is if you truly want to start a business, pay attention to where you want to start that business. It's always great to have a great idea to have a business, but does it make sense in the area you're looking in? Be mindful of, you may have a great idea, but depending on where you want to locate it, it may not work. So keep your options open, definitely, you know, piggyback on what they said. Check out the areas. Make sure it makes sense to put your business in there because you're going to put your heart and soul into it. There's no guarantee that any business will be, will, succeed, but if you can put the right things in place so that you at least have a solid ground to get one started, that's great. And the other part too is it, not only have your networks in place for you professionally, but have your personal ones too and check. Um, good friends that can say, hey, slow down a little bit or um, take a break or let me help you with this, um, they'll help you get through some, some of that too. An area uh, as a resource, the International Franchise Association, I, I believe it's um, fran.org, lists the fastest growing franchises and, and obviously that's an idea that maybe even a business that's being franchised, you can turn around and start in your own backyard uh, by yourself and be as successful. So lots of ideas out there and resources. Do you feel like there will ever be a point in time where there won't need to be women's only networks or, um, you know, like money provided for women and minorities? Do you think there'll be a time when the playing field's level? I certainly would hope so, but I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime. Ditto. <laughs> I thought we would have had it by now. <laughs> so you find yourself fighting the same old fights? No, they're different. There are a little different. Some, some of the fights, people don't even realize that you're fighting. Um, I think it certainly is easier, and I think that there is greater opportunity, but it's not a level playing field yet. 
So it's interesting. You said so. It's there's the same old fight, but with some differences to it. So that fight you're fighting is it's around sexism, discrimination, that same old thing we thought you know we'd all sort of gotten past. Is that what we're fighting? Or are we fighting ideas that we? I think a little bit of that. I, yeah, I, I think, think it still exists. There are stereotypes. There are. I'll, I'll tell you. I'm thinking of two networking groups uh, that I've recently joined in Oklahoma City. One's called the Economic Club. It's a dinner club. It costs you know two hundred dollars. You have to be invited to join. And I first learned about it when I saw a woman's picture on the front page of the paper that said, first woman president of the Economic Club." Well, she's a friend of mine, so I immediately called her up and said, congratulations being the first woman president of the Economic Club. She goes, oh, thanks. I said, by the way, what is the Economic Club? And she said, well, it's a club. Uh, we bring in really great speakers. And um, she said, you have to be invited to join. And you have to know, obviously, several people that are in the club. And they will nominate you. And I said, well, tell me the makeup. And she said, Linda, there are 220 men, and if you join, you will be the 12th woman in the economic club. So, you know, here was something that I sought out. But the sad part of it is, I have to say, none of those 11 women that are in the economic club are out there inviting other women to join, or I guess just hadn't thought of it or what. There's another long-time business breakfast uh, network called the Curve Fitzgerald Breakfast um, that can, goes all the way back to Senator Kerr and a man by the name of Friday Fitzgerald who, I, as the story goes, said to Senator Kerr, well, Senator, the boys want to know what's going on on the Hill. And Senator Kerr said, we'll get the boys together and we'll tell them. And so I don't know how long ago Senator Kerr was in office, but I guess it was a long time ago, but they've been having this breakfast twice a month uh, for many, many years. There are probably 95 men in this breakfast club and about six women, and I was the sixth woman. So again, it goes back to us all opening doors for each other, too, and, and helping each other with, with these things and finding out about what all is available there. Well, I would say it also has to do with what part of the country you're in. Because I would tell you that in Washington in 1983, there Board of, the Regional Board of Trade, which is our regional chamber of commerce, had a mid, has a midwinter dinner, which is purely a networking dinner. And in 1983, there were 1,470 men and maybe five or six women. Today, if you go, there are 750 men and 750 women. So I think it depends on the, the city and where you're located. Washington, D.C. happens to be a very um, pro-women-owned business community, and women are accepted in the community. And I think it just is a function of, and Pittsburgh, for example, was not so receptive, you know, in the early 90s. So I think it depends on where you are. And it is changing, but I, I think. Do Even Rotary International, I don't know how recent it's been, but for many, many years, they did not accept women. So. So you get the strategy, and then I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll end it just a moment with, with um, the last question gets a strategy that's used an awful lot, and that is, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a male owned business, I have a skill you need, and I can actually lead you, um, help you get a con contract with my skills, but they're set aside, set aside, uh, set aside for women owned businesses. Are you against that kind of exploitation? Um, you have some gut feelings against having me work, work under you when I'm when we're really, the, uh, and me using you to get more business do you do this? Do you, is this a common uh, practice of, of, of having letting someone use your 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 femaleness to get what they need, whether it's a strat, um, these set aside programs or something? Does it, does it offend you? Does it? Uh... Well, I don't actually. It doesn't offend me because I don't let anybody use me. Uh, first of all, if you're in that kind of situation, I'm going to get more money out of it than you are anyway. So, and 51% of the pie is better than no pie at all. And if I have the contracting, if you have the contracting vehicle or you have the connection and I have a better option of getting the job, it's business. And so we want to be able to, um, you know, do business. But I, I, I don't think I would ever have been accused of letting anybody use me. So. Um, I would say that we leverage our resources and 
you know, that's the way you have to play the game to do it. Yeah, well, I, I, I think it's unfortunate that we do have to still have these um, set-asides and all of that, but until we get to the point where everyone is paid equally for the work they do, we have to have various and sundry but I think the I think the set asides that we're talking about in federal contracting is not just a set aside for women. It's a set aside for small business versus big business because doing business with the federal government is very expensive. And if you're going to do business, you as a small business, and trust me, small business is many millions of dollars. It's not just you know a hundred thousand dollars. It takes a lot to do the marketing and to do all the insurance that you have to have. So the set-asides are really opportunities for small businesses, whether they're owned by women or men or veterans, to have a piece of the contracting pie. Because when you're, when you're walking in the shadow of a huge footprint of a two or three billion dollar company, it is hard to compete, I don't care how good you are. So the government recognizes that and they're trying to, since they're the biggest customer in the country, they're trying to do something. So it's not, because we, we don't have equal pay, it's, yes. it's, it's to give everybody an equal shot at some of the dollars. Okay. Want some more questions, please? Yes. Uh, kind of on a related topic, uh, as far as the EEOC goes, they will drive employers to uh, have influential decisions on their hiring power, whether it be this race or this gender, versus maybe raw talent. What are your views on that? Well, I hire based on talent. And I will never hire someone based on gender or ethnicity because that's not going to serve me well in the long run. I do, however, when I go through the hiring practice, if I'm using an employment agency, I will tell them I want a diverse pool of applicants because I'm not looking to just have one type of person in the, in the company because it doesn't reflect who my clients are. So if you're sitting across the table, and if, you, if you're sitting across the table and it's a diverse client base and all you have is either one gender or one race, you're not going to get the job. So it's a, it's a function of doing business. You have to be very careful in how you manage your people once you get them on board. But um, I don't, I've never hired just on the basis of gender or ethnicity. I haven't either. Even when, um, even though you may have been, um, have, you, have you ever been hired a business or gotten a contract award for your business because you were female? Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so help us. <laughs> That's a great. I mean, we were hired for doing. We were hired because we were a woman-owned business because the company was looking to fulfill requirements. Mm -hmm. Um, but that might have been the first time. The second time we were hired because we did the better job than anybody else did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is just kind of, in the federal contract arena, that's just kind of the way it goes. Are you offended to, but you, 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 it doesn't offend you to be hired just because you're a woman? You're no, because yourself. I wasn't hired just because I was a woman. I was hired because we were a woman-owned business that had a great reputation and could deliver. Okay. Have, you, have you felt that? Yes? No? Again, it, it gives small businesses the opportunity to compete with large businesses. It's, it's a way of becoming... Let's get some more student questions. Mm -hmm. um, there's an author, Tim Berry. He wrote uh, an article, Five Points on uh, Gender Gaps in Entrepreneurship. Um, he estimates around 70% of venture capitalists or angel investors being male. What if that's true, I mean, it's just an estimate. Um, what advice would you give to, to the female entrepreneurs here to prepare themselves to communicate effectively to that audience? I would say you have to be absolutely prepared. You have to know your numbers, you have to know your business, you have to stand up and present yourself as competent, and you cannot be meek and mild and expect anybody to invest in you. If you can't present your business in the most forceful, assertive, positive way with your numbers absolutely cold, no one's going to invest in you, whether you're male or female. And you have to have a truly a written business plan. Um, a woman recently came to me and asked me to invest in her business and I said, 
And I realize you've got all this experience in your uh, field of endeavor, but I want to see your business plan before we'll talk at all. And so I think, hopefully, those types of things are being taught in the School of Entrepreneurship here. How to write a business plan. Um, because many, many people who start a business think they have an idea and that's all they need. You really need to know. And I say start from scratch. Take care of your personal finances. Know how to do that first. Because that's if you don't do well on your personal finances, you're not going to do well on your business. So have your personal finances in order. Um, kind of going on with what Kai said about acquiring resources in terms of financing. Um, Dr. Roberts asked at the very beginning of this, um, what is the impact of being a woman entrepreneur on the entrepreneurial process? So whenever we talk about acquiring your resources, from the beginning of whenever you started your ventures, did you find any limitations in acquiring whatever you needed to start because of your uh, gender status? Um, no. I mean, I had to personally. I mean, I had to personally guarantee. Um, my husband and I had to personally guarantee all the credit instruments. But I don't think that that's. Uh, I don't. Well, that probably was because I was a woman at that time. But that was a long time ago. But I still had to personally guarantee it until the company was 18 years old. So. Well, I'm treating gender in isolation. Well, that was when you put gender together with age. So there's a wonderful book called Women Facing Unique Challenges in Their 20s as an entrepreneur versus in their 30s or. 40s or 50s. That's, that's a really good question because I, I think it is addressed. Um, in your 20s, you're probably looked upon as not having a, enough experience. In your 50s and 60s, you're probably looked upon as a has been. So I, I think all the more reason at whatever age you are, you've got to have your act together. and. You've got to have that confidence in yourself, and, and again, that goes back to knowing yourself, too. And if you know what your strengths are, it's going to really, really help you in your business. I think if you are 20, in your 20s, it's probably harder to be taken as seriously as if you were in your 30s or 40s. And so my advice would be, if you're going after a contractor, you're trying to start a business, and you think that that is an issue, then you bring someone on your team who has a little more gray hair. Um, because the, re the, the point is to launch your business and to grow your business. And so you figure out what the resources are that you need. And it may be at 20 that you need someone who's got a little more experience to be on the team. So put them on the team. Doesn't mean that you give up being the leader of the team. Just put them on the team. And there are some cases, for example, if you're in your 50s and you're trying to uh, do business with 20-year-olds, it might make some sense to have some of them on your team because there would be the ability to relate. So I think you have to know your audience, know your market, and then put your resources around you, which could conceivably be age-based or gender-based or ethnicity-based. You can also find opportunities where you can see other people present business plans to a group. There's an organization called Oklahoma Venture Forum, and they do. Okay. So you all know about it? More questions? Yes. Um, growing up as a girl, you know, there's just some things that are guy things. And if you want to do them, you've got to work twice as hard and prove up, essentially. Have you found that since historically the business entrepreneurship world is men, have you found the same thing? And, and if so, what have you done to kind of prove yourself? I always beat my male competition because we were better. <laughs> and we delivered. I took it as a challenge. How much will it? You know, in the hospitality industry, it's a, it's a good balance of, of men and women. I think probably because I'm a bar owner, I think there were certain you know, I have a great, uh, it's funny to say, uh, really my brokers who I order from were my biggest challenges was my delivery people, my delivery guys. Um, and so I established a relationship with them um, straight on. I have the cleanest bathrooms, so they come to use my bathrooms when they do deliveries. I, I think it's, I, I have learned to network with, I, I, it's a challenge for me. I want to get to know the people that may be the hardest to win over, so to speak, and I view that as a great challenge. My delivery people were on great terms, but it took a little bit. Them to be on time. How would you I think my advice would be that if you find yourself in a situation like that, move. Because 
uh, it's, it can be pretty readily shown whether or not there's going to be the right opportunity there for women. Um, so if it's not happening for you, either in your own business or working for someone else, quickly move in a different direction uh, because there, there are people that can get stuck with a company. Um, they're afraid to leave because they're, they're content, but they're really not working at their full potential and they feel that they are not allowed to, to move in that direction. So go somewhere else. We're in the back. Do you think uh, gender is more of a female issue than a male issue? <coughs> I'm asking this because uh, when we discuss about gender, we tend to speak more about women. I think I probably would agree with that a little bit. I think we tend to feel there's a little bit more of a fight sometimes to on the situation. I think it's changing. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I would say that there's... But I also think that the gender issue is changing because now 40-year-old uh, white men are considered a disadvantaged group because they have, because that is the group that systematically is getting moved one way or another to allow for other ethnicities or women. And so if you're in the process of releasing someone, um, a white male who is over 40, you have to be careful because they are in a protected class. And that is, that is, that's a recent change in the employment law. And so I guess I would, initially I would have said, no, I think it's basically a, a female thing because of the history, I mean, we haven't we haven't quite had the right to vote for 100 years yet, so clearly there is a discrepancy. But now that is changing, and four-year-old white men are considered a protected class. So if you are releasing someone, you have to be very careful. You have to do it correctly. Um, as a woman business or business owner in a male-dominated business culture. Do you ever find yourself um, casting aside your feminine traits in order to be taken more seriously or get a job done? Changed in the business world, so we we have a more equal playing field. 
to where we can just be ourselves. I think I'm, I'm more about getting to know who I'm working with and, and knowing what type of personality they have, what they like, what they don't like. So I don't know if it's uh, showing less feminine traits. It's just really to know that person and knowing how to interact with them to get what we both want out of the situation. This might be a bit of an interesting one, but in terms of gender and the emerging trends of um, same sex, how, I mean, with your dealing, same sex uh, marriages and stuff, how much do those affect, especially in organizations, um, like entrepreneurial organizations, and hiring and all those kind of things? But like basically, um, gay stuff in terms of gender equilibrium. Where do you think they they fall in it? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, are you saying more people? Are we hiring more people that are gay? Are we seeing more businesses? Yes. Entrepreneurs? I was like, what affects them more? Uh, let's say a guy who is. Um, in terms of gender uh, issues in the workplace or in, the, in an entrepreneurial company, how do you deal with such in terms of gender equilibrium and stuff? How do you view them? In, in my business, it doesn't make any difference to me. Okay. I want the right person for the right job. Any person I, I work with, I don't need to know their personal life. I want them to come and do their best job they can for the wine bar and make my business successful. Um, it doesn't matter to me one way or the other. I think everyone has their own life, so that doesn't that doesn't face me. I want the right person for the job. It never had an impact in my business either. I agree. The less you know about people's personal backgrounds, the better in terms of hiring, because then you're hiring them based on performance. And when you are when you learn interviewing skills, you learn how to be very careful not to cross the line where you're asking for information that you really don't want to have and don't need, and, don't need and doesn't have any impact on what they do. Now it may have some impact in terms of the benefits that you provide and that's really more an issue of what the state that you're and the, you know, the municipality in which your business is located require you because some states require that same-sex uh, partnerships are treated as marriages and get benefits and other places don't and you know it's just a function of that's a law more than anything else. Yes. Okay. To add to another question that was asked on each of the women in the work. Oh, women. Oh, women. Sorry. Where do you see? Um, where do you see policy and laws regarding these projections of women concentrating a lot of these small businesses? Business small business. That is, where do you see policy in the next couple of years as? A lot of these business, a lot of the, a lot of the, I guess businesses are becoming more female owned. Do you see a policy um, minimizing because of the availability of these um, benefits for female owned companies, or do you see them actually growing more? So where do you, where do you see that? Because you mentioned policy, and you mentioned you see a lot, which I'm not. I don't think the policies will change in the next three to five years because I think that. <coughs> The number of women-owned businesses that are actually higher growth businesses that would be doing business with the federal government or state governments, that number is not growing as exponentially as just the number in general. So I don't think the policy will change. I ask that because in Washington, D.C., as you said, is very progressive, and so there's a lot more female-owned businesses, as you said, less than women-owned businesses. So can I actually add a question to that? Sure. Um, how do your experiences in Washington you since there are since there's a different mentality towards business as females. I'm sure it did because when I started doing business in other cities around the country, I had to remember that I wasn't in Washington anymore, and that in many cases, it, and actually in Pittsburgh, which is one of our favorite cities, um, it was different uh, when I first started doing projects in Pittsburgh. And over the 15 years that we did work there, it actually changed but initially. Women-owned businesses were not so readily um, accepted. In fact, I would go to meetings and someone would come in and say, are you the secretary? And I would say to her, no, are you? 
And she was the manager and made the assumption that I was the secretary, and I explained to her that I was the president of the company. But that was in a jurisdiction where that would never have happened in Washington. And yet, uh, and I would say when we worked in Kansas City, interestingly enough, it was much more receptive to women-owned business than one would have assumed. And then in some places on the West Coast, it was not. So it really is you have to sort of figure out what the jurisdiction is and remember that you're in a different place, and that's one of the things. It was an aha moment in Pittsburgh. How about here, Elaine, and Stillwood? I think there. I think more women-owned businesses are occurring. I mean, just just from even downtown. I mean, mm -hmm. I just from seeing that growth. I think there's a. Uh, Let me ask a question. Reason. Back to the opportunity the conversation that happened a little earlier. Um, I mean, as Craig said in the opening background or foundation laying, socialization is a reality. And people continue to be socialized in whatever ways they are. Um, we still, if, if I say the word nurse, people still think female. I say the word airline pilot, still say male, even though there are plenty of female airline pilots and plenty of male nurses. So socialization continues to be, sure. right? And, and a lot of young women don't grow up being challenged by their surroundings to start construction companies or steel companies or trucking companies or what have you. And so we still end up with stereotypical Scenarios where women are starting gift basket companies or retail or, or, or uh, hair salons, whatever. And when asked, so, so the question I'm getting to is how can women expand their opportunity to rise? You talk about looking at your skills and your strengths and so forth, but you still have to see those opportunities. How can women expand their opportunity horizons beyond the stereotype? I think just even since I've been growing up, there's so much more opportunity just based on access to technology and internet to see what businesses are thriving. I think um, it's there needs to be word or uh, more. In, um, information shared about those companies, maybe that a woman didn't necessarily start if you're talking about a non-stereotypical company. Um, I think of Ditchwich out of Perry where the CEO right now is, is a woman and it's a manufacturing company and she's done very well with it. She's changed it around and maybe she didn't start it, but I think maybe there needs to be more success stories shared about those women who maybe have expanded on existing companies so there is more empowerment for girls to say, okay, you know what, I could be a part of this business entity and, and maybe I could start something or maybe I could, you know, I think there's more stories out there than not. There are a lot more companies that are now being run by women who are the granddaughters or the daughters of whoever started it. And I think there's something to be said about learning that too um, and getting the word out. I don't know. Well, I've been involved with the Girl Scouts for 20 years and for 20 years we've tried to bring executive women in to meet Girl Scouts so that they can see that they can see that there are other opportunities out there and just to begin to envision that that's a long-term process because they're kids, you know, at the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. But we have seen that by having exposure to women who do other things that are sort of non-traditional roles, some of the young Girl Scouts that we've been working with are actually pursuing different types of careers. So it is, it's, I think it's society's job to try to find ways to present other selves to young girls so that they are not so stereotypical. I actually think it's society's responsibility to do it for young boys, too. Well, that's what I was say, being early childhood, um, okay, I think yeah. it's up to us to, you know, the girls complain in the truck area, in the block area, and the boys complain in the housekeeping area, and it's, I mean, I think you've got to start from that level, too. If someone's really good in math, it shouldn't matter what their gender is. You encourage them to do some things that are are outside that, you know, comfort zone, and if their strengths are in that area, let them expand on that. Don't shut them off and say, no, you've got to go back to this, because this is the way we've always done it. So I think it's, I 
passion about early childhood comes out and that too you can you know you see a skill in yeah. someone that I don't growing. remember the exact statistics but it's my understanding that there are more women even entering college today than men plus uh, the professions of law and medicine you're seeing many more women um, becoming doctors and, and lawyers and that's a great example of going into other professions that were not necessarily thought of for women. Uh, so hopefully that will lead the cause to go on to many other endeavors in business too. Does it inspire you to move on to try something else, something else new in a new area? I think we could say that. I think we've been there. <laughs> I think we are there. I think we are there. <laughs> we have time for um, one more, two more? Please. Um, do you think core values um, as far as a woman-owned business versus a men business differ? And if they, do you believe they differ, how do you think they differ by who owns the company and creating those values? I may be naive in this, but I think it depends on the person. I could have a set of core values about my business and I want to run it that may be different from um, Pat and Linda that doesn't make us either right or wrong, it just makes it different for yeah. what we want to make our business do. So I don't, to me it's not necessarily gender-based. Gender -based. I agree, and I yeah. think even big businesses today are taking a much stronger <coughs> look at taking care of the whole employee. I mean, look what Chesapeake has done on their campus in Oklahoma City. What is it, a $40 million health club that they have? And there are just so many things that they're doing as an example. Um, companies today realize that if they take care of their employees and, uh, and their health, they're going to be much better employees. So I think those core values are really important regardless of what you are. Uh, going back to female traits, we've talked a lot about the overcoming the negatives and uh, I was wondering, is there any, uh, professionally of course, is there any, <laughs> is there any situations uh, such as, uh, you mentioned nurt uh, your nurturing aspects and uh, maybe you were seen as a less, of, less competitive uh, than a male to male relationship. Is there any times where business relationships, <coughs> it's easier or you benefit maybe because of your female uh, traits and abilities? No, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm sure that it depends on the, the person. I wouldn't say that I can have a relationship with a guy just because I'm a woman. I've got to have a relationship with him on a professional uh, basis because there's value in it for both sides. Um, in some ways, perhaps they don't find us so competitive, but that might be a mistake. <laughs> I think we've um, I think we've to the end, so I think it's time for our team. Thank you so much. So you got some takeaways for us. All right. So what we learned today, um, I'll start with Linda. It's never too late or too early to start your own business or follow your dreams. Um, it's always always have a plan A and a plan B. Dress for where you want to go. Um, uh, the most important factor in your career is attitude. Um, find out what your strengths are and have three levels of contacts, uh, mentors, peers, and people that you mentor. Uh, from Pat, we've learned that it's important to be assertive and prepared. Know your numbers. Figure out what you want in life. Find your voice and use it. You can have it all, just not at the same time. And uh, be professional and on your game. And from Aling, uh, the downtown is the heartbeat of the city. Be passionate about what you do. Um, when you're do, doing something right, you don't have to change your vision. Surround yourself with people who can embrace your vision and empower them. Uh, keep good networks uh, and peers that will keep you grounded. And um, you won't have success unless your finances are in order. <laughs>